In this video, I'm going to introduce the idea of the finite well and do some comparing and contrasting between the infinite well and the finite well. We start with the infinite well because it is the simplest to study. So remember that we have the Schrodinger equation, we have the energy eigenvalue equation, and the potential, that V, is really the key that distinguishes between one system and another. That and whether you're in one dimension, Cartesian, spherical, etc. So these have two different potentials. The V is different. And so for the infinite well, we basically say, okay, V is zero in the center and then infinite everywhere else. And for simplicity, we usually call this zero and we call this L. So it's a width of L. Now, for the finite well, the difference is that it's zero one place and then there's some fixed value that is finite, finite, everywhere else. And so sim for simplicity, we're starting with something symmetric. So the value on the left is the same as the right. And now here's where it gets a little bit tricky. We could call this zero an L, we could, but it's not actually symmetric around that. So it's going to make the math harder. So in this case, there's actually a homework problem where you say, well, what if we solve this instead from the say negative A to positive A, make it symmetric around zero. That's actually harder because of the boundary conditions then. Mathematically, it's simplest to do it this way. Mathematically here, it's going to be simpler to do the other case. So we could call this, for instance, negative L over 2, 0, L over 2. Or you could call this negative A and A. That's up to you. Just notice whatever you're following, the book, this video, we can relabel this different ways. So this is, this is our starting point. We have two different potentials. And so we would write this, for instance, as V of X is equal to 0 when X is between 0 and L and infinite otherwise. And in this case, we would say V of X is equal to zero. Obviously this could be a value like two, but then we can just kind of shift the whole thing up and down. So we usually are interested in potential differences or the energy above this minimum. So it's for simplicity again, we would call this zero. And again, you can relabel this in different ways, but this is the labeling I will use for this video. And then we have some fixed value otherwise. So otherwise, else, same thing. So why this matters is, again, when we go back to the Schrodinger equation, we have that we are, let me make sure I get this right, um, second derivative then with respect to position, d dx squared plus v of x right, again this important potential that defines what our system is, multiplied by our energy eigenstates, right, in the position representation. The n represents our quantum number here, because we expect these to be quantized energy eigenstates. And we have that. Okay, so we have something like this. Now notice that over here this was pretty simple, right, when we broke this into two pieces, we said that when it's zero, this term is zero, and we just get to think about this, right? And the second derivative, okay, that's going to be the, that's how we get that differential equation and then find that there's sines and cosines. Now the key was for the infinite square well, that when it was infinite here, the only way we can have an infinite term multiplied by a thing that equals that thing is if the thing itself is zero. So from this, we said that our wave function was in fact zero if we're outside of the well. We don't actually have that case now. We have a constant term here in the situation where we are outside of the well. So the key here is that this is going to be more complex, more, more difficult, not complex per se. That here we said, okay, our wave function is zero outside of the well. The reason for that was coming from this equation. That's not the case here our wave function is not zero outside the well. So we have to kind of ask, well, what does that mean? So briefly, and we'll go through how this is true, we'll go through the math, right? My first energy, my first function looks something like that, but ideally symmetric, right? So basically half a sine wave. My second one would be a full sine wave. And there was these clear boundary conditions that at the edge, our wave function has to be zero, because phi equals zero once you're outside. Now here, we're going to have quantized energy levels again. 
And so if I draw my first energy level, we can imagine that it's going to look pretty similar when we're in the well. But the difference is the boundary conditions. There's no reason why your wave function has to go to zero once you're outside. We're going to have a differential equation, and from that we'll figure out what it is, but it doesn't have to be zero. So what we're actually going to get is it does something really similar on the inside. And as you go to infinity, it does go to zero, but then something like this happens. So it's really similar, but it's allowed to kind of expand outside. So if we sketch the next one, that now it again kind of is allowed to come up, goes down, and then goes through. So we'll go through the math of where this comes from, but the key is it's going to look really similar when it's still inside of the well, but it's allowed to stretch outside. So um, in the next video, I'll, I'll go through more of the math of setting this up, but it's important to understand when I say finite well versus infinite well, which one do I mean, what are the similarities, and what are the differences.